Welcome to today's Prophecy in the News. I'm J.R. Church. And I'm Gary Stearman. Today we're going to talk about the Mediterranean Union in Bible Prophecy. You know, it all started with the French President Sarkozy. Nicolas Sarkozy hatched the idea during his election campaign. He called for an enlargement of Union nations, and he called it the Mediterranean Union. Well, J.R., Bastille Day of the year 2009 is a French national holiday, sort of like our Fourth of July, and it celebrates the overthrowing of the Bastille. Big day, everybody is out. Nicolas Sarkozy chose that day to make an announcement, which just happened to coincide with his election campaign. The Mediterranean Union, he proposed, would be 17 states surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. And as we look at a map, there's a remarkable resemblance between the new proposed Mediterranean Union and the old Union called the Roman Empire. Okay, here's the map. You can see the old Roman Empire and all of the nations around the uh, rim of the Mediterranean make up this old Roman Empire as it was, I guess, in its heyday. Yes. But the new European Union looks exactly like it, covering the same nations. Let's have the uh, new Mediterranean Union up here. There we go. Now you can see the European Union is in blue, and the green represents uh, the rest of the old Roman Empire. And today they are all Islamic nations. So here is a a powerful Mediterranean Union coming along with all of the states of the old Roman Empire. Shall we call it a revived Roman <laughs> Empire, Gary? We might, J.R. Uh, Sarkozy suggested that uh, the Mediterranean Union would bring together European and Arabian leaders. And of course, it covers uh, North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, there have been some holdouts, like uh, the infamous Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, but I think he's hope maybe holding out for more money. Uh, he wants to come on board. Uh, however controversial the new Mediterranean Union may seem, it certainly is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy in one way, that in the latter days, governments are going to come together into larger and larger units. We know that eventually the world's going to be divided up into 10 economic regions, mm -hmm. but, um, and uh, political regions as well. But these... Um, Islamic nations uh, have a tremendous population. They're very poor, but they're looking at this rich European Union and uh, thinking, you know, that they can become a viable part of it. And Europe wants them so badly to be a part of this Mediterranean Union. They have made the first secretary general, the head honcho of this group, a Muslim, an a Egyptian Muslim. Muslim. A and besides that, Barcelona, Spain is to be the headquarters of the Mediterranean Union. Uh, listen to this from the UK Guardian, a, a very large newspaper in uh, the uh, British Isles. Quote, Sarkozy's big idea is to use Imperial Rome's center of the world as a unifying factor linking 44 countries that are home to some 800 million people. Well, that's the way this article kicks off, J.R., and, and that makes a big deal out of it. Wow, you know, uh, India's population is just over a billion. Mm -hmm. China's population is just over a billion. And this new Mediterranean Union then could uh, be a third entity compared uh, population-wise with them. If he can make it work, if, if the uh, EU uh, and the Euro can become the engine of, of a new economy, uh, it'll be fabulous from his point of view. From my point of view, J.R., uh, world domination seems on the horizon. Yeah, and it's a coming disaster as far as Bible prophecy is concerned. Jesus is going to come back and put a stop to all of that. Yes. If this is the revived Roman Empire. We don't know that it is, but we're going to discuss that in t on today's Prophecy in the News. Um, Gary, we noticed that with the oil money of mm -hmm. the Middle East and the nations, uh, the uh, uh, Islamic nations, um, they may have picked up the tab for the failing euro. I understand the euro is just on the brink of disaster. Well, JR, as we make this broadcast today, uh, there is very bad news in Europe. Uh, because based upon 
a faltering U.S. economy, uh, the euro is, has been discovered to be weak. That is to say, and in the words of several European uh, uh, heads of state just within the last 24 hours or so, Europe is broke. And I've actually heard that term being used. And I think that was behind Sarkozy's decision to bring everybody together. As you put it, he wants to get some Arab oil money pumped into the European Union. Do you remember when the Islamics were driven out of Spain? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Th they, they tried to invade Europe. They wanted to spread Islam all over Europe. Today, of course, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, this little holdout down there in Libya, has said that they're going to conquer uh, Europe without firing a shot. That's because the Arab population, the Islamic population in the Euro various European countries are growing eight times faster, eight times faster than the European population. Mm. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Percentage-wise. To me, uh, there's another interesting element in all this, and that is uh, when you talk about a union of economies, you're also talking about a union of armies because armies uh, are, really p are really in existence or put in place to uphold economic groups. That's the function of an army. Yeah. If somebody uh, gets a little bit out of line, you can send your army over and straighten them up. Well, <clears throat> when we read about that big invasion, the famous one in Ezekiel 38, and we think about that alliance of Western nations that comes down into the Middle East, uh, Gomer is in there. Yes. And Togarma of the North Quarters. In fact, when you begin to think about it, J.R., the, the Mediterranean Union looks like it might be allied with Gog. And Persia? Persia. You know, this Mediterranean Union has Turkey, which, by the way, was not accepted into the European Union. That's right. And they've, I don't know if this is like tossing the dog a bone or not, but the Europeans have told the Turks that... Uh, this does not preclude them being someday accepted as part of the European Union. Well, population-wise, Gary, if we go on 40 years into the future, according to logistics and statistics projections, uh, the Islamic uh, people in, uh, let's, in, in the various European countries are going to actually have the vote. They're going mm -hmm. to have more population than the Europeans. And what's going to happen to the Europeans, to the to the Italians and the French and the Spanish and the Germans and the English. What's going to happen to all of those societies when they are overrun by Islam? Indeed. Now, when we read Ezekiel 38, uh, verses 5 and 6, uh, we read about the lineup of nations that will eventually occur. And I've always wondered, how in the world would you ever get Russia in alignment with Eastern Europe, Central Europe, some of the Mediterranean countries? Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them. That, that takes in Persia, but also Ethiopia and Libya are in North Africa, <clears throat> part of the Mediterranean Union. Gomer with all his bands. Now that would be Central Europe and part of Eastern Europe. The House of Togarma of the North Quarters. That would, the House of Togarma traditionally was the, the Turkish Empire or the uh, Asia Minor as it was known in biblical days. But of the North Quarters also takes in all of the land in Eastern Europe up to Finland. So the House of Togarma of the North Quarters would be allied, and all his bands, that is, countries surrounding, surrounding the House of Togarma of the North Quarters, and many people with thee. I've always privately wondered how you'd get all these people to come together to invade Israel. But if the Mediterranean Union allied with Russia, then you'd, you'd essentially have what the Bible talks about. Now, uh, Gary and I have considered for the past several years that Mystery Babylon uh, is a consortium of nations, not just one single city, because the Greek term megalia polis mm -hmm. uh, is actually becomes megalopolis. Megalopolis. And so it's <coughs> not just one city, but many cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've considered the possibility that it will be uh, major trading centers around the world, plus the beast itself that rises up out of the sea of humanity in Revelation chapter 13, we've considered that to be the United Nations. It has a bureaucracy, 
ready to go whenever sovereignty is given to it and it can rule for three and a half years otherwise uh, logistics itself would take longer than that just to get a new entity in place on the other hand we have this mystery Babylon who rides the beast now is it possible that Europe is mystery Babylon just consider the possibility the European Union has built a parliament building in the shape of an unfinished tower like the Tower of Babel and they have touted um, many languages reduced to one language mm -hmm. and uh, many nations reduced to one nation a European Union so this is the Tower of Babel in reverse instead of a multiple of languages which cannot be understood they all come down to one understandable language and then we have this woman that rides the beast the very motif or logo of the European Union well if y the European Union is the woman that rides the beast the beast might be this Mediterranean Union you know because it, it looks like be. on the map that this uh, blue countries sit on and and direct and ride this uh, this beast of the green nations the Islamic nations is it possible then that Europe is simply mm, uh, having some kind of a union with the Islamic nations with the possibility in mind that they can control Islam I don't know that that's the case here in Revelation chapter 17, but it, at least it has the possibilities. Well, to the Europeans, uh, J.R., I think the woman riding the beast is an encouraging figure. I think they look forward to that with hope because the woman is called Europa. That's her name. Yes. In ancient, ancient history and mythology, the goddess Europa uh, was taken up on the back of this uh, white bull uh, that was actually the god Zeus. And Zeus stands for the world powers, that is, the power of this planet. Let's, another name for him, of course, would be Satan. And Satan, of course, would like to take control over all the world. And to me, the woman riding the beast is a picture of Europe riding upon the world, sort of directing the course of the world. I think mm -hmm. they see themselves in that role. Well, you've got to understand that the very first union in 1948 that came about uh, from which I guess the ten unions will emulate is Europe. Europe became the first Europe, uh, union of nations mm -hmm. in world history and they did it without war, they did it without guns, they did it with diplomacy and so we have this, this uh, woman that rides the beast but notice there are ten horns on this beast and Gary the ten horns have to be in my opinion a worldwide regime and they hate Europe <coughs> and yeah. they burn her with fire. They burn her with fire. Now we're going to read here for a couple of scriptures. I'd like to start with Daniel and you can pick up in Revelation because Daniel has a, a name for this beast. He calls it the fourth beast uh, and it is the last great world empire. And, and uh, we read in Daniel 7, 7 and 8, And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns, horns being divisions of power. I considered the horns, says Daniel, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, uh, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes. Eyes stand for intelligence and discernment and vision in Scripture. Eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So we have this powerful individual rising up, but what's interesting to me about Daniel's prophecy is there's fighting going on as this f uh, final beast takes form. In other words, it's not a peaceful thing at all. So apparently there's a battle for supremacy within this fourth beast and finally it's dominated by the Antichrist. Now w that's the foundation and J.R. is going to read uh, out of the book of Revelation which really speaks of the end of things. Mm -hmm. Well do you notice that in Daniel there is no woman? Yes. There's no woman riding the beast. 
where then did uh, did John get this idea? I don't. I've never seen it in, uh, let's say, for example, in the study we made on the Book of Enoch. He doesn't refer to some yeah. proverbial woman, and yet this mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So he goes all the way back and picks up, mm. I guess, Nimrod. Oh yes. And Babylon, and the idea of the goddess sure. worship. Uh, we do have the goddesses of all those ancient nations. Mm -hmm. They are all the same, whether they be Ashtaroth mm -hmm. or uh, Minerva or Isis, Isis yeah. or Athena or whoever it is. S so. Certainly in uh, John's day when he wrote the book of the Revelation they were quite prominent the gr in the Greek culture. Athena especially. <laughs> yes especially. <laughs> so we've got this beast the fourth beast out of the sea of humanity and it is a raging sea so there's war mm -hmm. continually uh, warring. And it says here that there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore wh that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now let me just stop here and tell you Gary that this seems to be to me the motif of all the nations. Mm -hmm. There is a woman at the head of all of these nations. It is the goddess worship. In, in America it is Columbia. Uh, whose statue sits in uh, New York Harbor. Whose statue stands atop the dome of our Capitol building. And yes. inside the motif. Uh, around uh, all of the uh, frescoes. And the paintings and what have you. Are all Greek mythology. Roman mythology. Uh, we don't find anything about Christ. We don't have any pictures of Jesus. That's in true. Washington, no statues to Jesus in Washington D.C. No crosses. Uh, we have all of them are obelisks and uh, domes and what have you from these ancient religions. And one quick word. Uh, I noticed as you read there, uh, once again it hit me, uh, she sits upon many waters. Now the picture of Europa in her modern uh, position and she's featured on European postage, European money, coins uh, in uh, the EU. And JR, the picture of this woman is she's pictured with seven waves beneath her. Yes. Seven waves would correspond to the seven seas, depicting Europe as riding the beast on seven seas, in other words, uh, being an international power. I think that's the European dream. Yeah. And the Bible says that she sits on many waters. And it's amazing to me that this bull, this white bull she sits on, is Zeus. Yes. Satan himself. And they brag about that. They do. It's, it's uh, well, amazing uh, to me. Another quick uh, a point to be made here along the way as we talk in Berlin, the altar of Zeus that used to sit in Pergamos uh, was disassembled taken piece by piece and reassembled in Berlin. The altar of Zeus is called Satan's seat in the book of Revelation. So there's Zeus, which is the beast. There's the woman in Europe. Uh, Europe clearly uh, in the plan of Satan appears to be aimed at some kind of dominance. But JR, it's not just Europe alone. There, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Yes. And for that reason, the book of Revelation calls her mystery. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Mystery, Gary, this refers to the mystery religion, yes. the esoteric religion of the adepts, uh, those who, um, who are initiated into knowledge that other human beings don't understand. Oh, and we have her in the New Testament. She is called Diana of the Ephesians. Uh, she's the head of the Babylonian mystery religion, the, uh, the worship of Mithras, uh, which was part of the Babylonian mystery religion in the days of Jesus and the apostles. And, and JR, this is all so very clear uh, that someone wants this new union of states to become a power center that controls the goings on in all the world. JR, as originally proposed, the Mediterranean Union, and I'm reading uh, here, 
uh, from a European newspaper, again, The, the Guardian. <clears throat> uh, the union's members would include 27 EU nations, 12 Mediterranean countries that are members of the EU's Barcelona process. Again, that's where uh, the proposed headquarters of the Mediterranean Union uh, will be. And the four Balkan countries bordering the Mediterranean. The French Foreign Ministry hailed the first summit as a great success and notes that it was the first time Israel was present at such a level in an international institution alongside the Palestinian Authority. And the reason I brought this up is because in that first meeting, Israel was prominently featured, given a position and, by the way, uh, an opportunity to speak, and so was the Palestinian Authority. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, sitting next to Mahmoud Abbas, <laughs> yes. uh, Ehud Olmert sitting next to Mahmoud Abbas, and then just nearby was uh, Bashar Assad, mm -hmm. uh, president of Syria. And they all seem to be one big happy family. Oh, We're yeah. going to do great things, you know. And Barcelona, think of it. That's, that's where the, where the M Muslims lost their uh, battle of trying to conquer Spain and moving up into the north. And uh, so here's the Islam's, uh, Islamic people's thinking, Barcelona, that's where we lost the war. That's right. And, uh, he, um, uh, we're going to win the war this time without firing a single shot. You know, among the Islamics, there is the belief that any place uh, an Islamic government has ever set foot is from that moment forward Islamic territory, never again to be given up. Well, it was quite a slap in the face for them in the Middle Ages when they were forced to leave Spain. Uh, and so this is quite a uh, feather in their cap to be yes. able to come back to Barcelona. And they will move into those areas, I can tell you, because they have a plan. Islam has a plan to dominate the world uh, for the greater good, shall we say. They want, uh, you know, they, they don't have missionaries like, like Christians. We have Christian missionaries that go out and tell the gospel story and win people to Christ. And, and, uh, we, but we try to stay out of the governments and uh, uh, Christian influence among the people and the population. And uh, it's, it's a very um, lamb-like uh, situation, but not Islam. They want to take over the world, and they're going to do it with a sword. Mm. So they're moving quickly in that direction. They, they must have some feeling that uh, Allah wants them to take over the world pretty soon, like in this generation. Absolutely, and the leaders of the EU have designs on world control. We know that, as do the, the leaders of Islam. I'm going to read from Daniel again because it speaks to this point. Daniel 7.23, talking about this fourth beast, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth, and it shall tread down and break it in pieces. Now, the term whole earth is used there. And uh, this, to me, eliminates the idea that the revived Roman Empire will simply be a European or Mediterranean phenomenon. It's going to sweep the whole earth. And somehow power will be divided among people around the entire globe. and. As Daniel says, it'll break down in pieces all of the nations that it tramples upon. It's a global phenomenon. Europe, make no mistake, wants to be the leader of that power group. Well, you know, the United Nations is, to me, the bureaucracy that will become the New World Order. It was established in 1945 uh, with, I think, that purpose in mind. Um, and all of these nations in the European Union and the Mediterranean Union are all members of the United Nations. And so uh, the stage is being set, Gary. The stage mm. is being set. Mm -hmm for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled just as the prophets wrote it centuries, millennia ago. Well, it's written in the Bible. <clears throat> it's a quotation. When you begin to see these things come to pass, then look up. <laughs> for yeah. your redemption draweth nigh. And that brings us to a time in the program when we want to extend an invitation uh, to you to join us as members of the body of Christ. You know, the invitation is open, J.R., and we always like to talk about that. 
Jesus is the king of kings. Don't forget that. And by the way, he's got everything under control. He said, uh, be not, uh, you know, don't, don't uh, be afraid. Uh, don't be too concerned. Everything is under control. These things must come to pass. And so I would say to you, the one you need to trust is the one who created us all. Uh, Jesus, the creator, came to this earth 2,000 years ago, died on Calvary's cross for the payment of your sins. If you don't recognize that and realize that, then you'll have to pay for your own sins. But think of it. You have someone who loves you enough to pay the price on your sin. All you have to do is repent of your sins, turn in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, tell him you know you're a sinner and you're sorry, ask him to forgive you and save you. With a prayer something like this, it doesn't have to be these same words, but you could pray, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my heart and life. And save my soul. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. And if you'll do that. He'll give you eternal life. Just that quick. And it'll last for eternity. And it's free. Just for the repenting. I'm J.R. Church with Gary Stearman. Until next time. Keep looking up. I'm J.R. Church. Welcome to today's Prophecy in the News. And I'm Gary Stearman, and today we're going to continue our discussion of Eschatology 101. On today's program, we're going to be talking about levels of biblical interpretation. I've written an article for our February 2010 issue of Prophecy in the News magazine called Levels of Biblical Interpretation. Now these are a series that I put together to teach a college course in Eschatology 101. And uh, there are 42 of these lectures and this today is our second one. And so over the next uh, three and a half years we're going to be dealing with this at least one a month. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me levels of biblical interpretation. J.R., uh, when you start your article, uh, you point out, and I think very wisely so, that uh, a lot of Christians today, as serious about their Christian walk as they may be, nevertheless fail to be instructed in the basics of understanding how the Bible is put together. Uh, we read it literally. We believe it's divinely inspired. And we believe that it talks about past, present, and future. And you can't leave out the future. Indeed. Well, there are three levels of biblical interpretation. And uh, I want us to go through these very briefly. There's the primary interpretation, practical application, and prophetic implication. And as you said, Gary, most people never get past the primary and the practical mm -hmm. views of Scripture. That's right. In fact, the ideal today in Christendom, I think the majority of Christendom, is applicational teaching. And not, uh, there's nothing wrong with applicational teaching because the Bible tells you how to walk the walk and how to improve your walk in Christ on a day daily basis. Uh, that, of course, comes from reading the first level of Scripture. <clears throat> yes. And but there are other levels of, uh, of reading. You can, you can read the Psalms and really get a lot out of them. You can uh, read the Psalms on a little bit deeper level and apply those things to your life. But J.R., there's another level and another level after that. Yes, indeed. Now, let's talk about the primary interpretation for just a moment. That means read the book. I think everybody ought to read the book. I had a member of my congregation one time come up to me and say, uh, Pastor, is John in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Hey, you need to read the book. <laughs> so not only do we need to read the book, and by the way, today there may be some who say, well, I can understand the complicated uh, passages and all those hard names, you know, of the Old Testament. If you cannot read this book, it's, it is written in simple English, all right, the Bible, then get a set of CDs, let somebody read it to you, 
and then read along with him until you learn to read the book. And by the way, you can go through this book from Wednesday night to Sunday morning.